Just when you thought that Star Wars couldn't surprise you in a sincere way anymore, this episode manages to pull a few tricks out of the bag that truly presents the show as its own separate entity, whilst existing as part of the same continuity and universe as all the other canon Star Wars works. And I'm not just talking about the fact that there was enough meaningful dialogue and exposition throughout this that helped to highlight both Sabine and Ahsoka's journeys, or the fact that there was another moment of dissension in the galaxy with the First Order steadily creeping up through the ranks of the New Republic in almost every way, Thought we wouldn't notice, but we did. Or the excellently choreographed fight sequences that should make the crew of Kenobi bow their heads in shame. Look at it! Look at it! Look at it! I want all of you to look at it! But more precisely, the way this one episode has expanded on the lore of Star Wars, possibly inviting Legends material back into canon, and altered the understandings we possess as to what exists and how we perceive things in this universe. This episode puts the emphasis on a galaxy far far away by naming the existence of another planet in another galaxy that has apparently existed in old children's tales in the Jedi Temple. This episode puts the emphasis on a galaxy far far away by naming the existence of another world within another galaxy, and is now becoming a tangible reality that shines bright in the sky is the point of origin for where we will no doubt find the young Jedi Ezra Bridger and Grand Admiral Thrawn. To defeat an enemy you must know them. Not simply their battle tactics, but their history, philosophy, art. This one picks up with Sabine in hospital recovering from her wounds at the hands of Shin last time, where Ahsoka and Huang question her about the events of the previous night. And it's here where she explains what transpired and she was able to unlock the key, but lost all of the data and the map itself during the fight. You're the worst. However, she mentions that two HKs attacked her, but she only took out one, cluing Ahsoka in that the surviving one may have gone back to take out anyone who goes look in. You know why? Because f you, that's why! And her hunch proves to be right, with her slicing its head off and Sabine manages to salvage its origins in the hope of retracing their steps to find out where Elsbeth and Co may have gone. They locate its origins to Elsbeth's old factories on Corellia, with Ahsoka, Hera and Chopper heading off to investigate, whilst Huang tries to navigate Sabine's existential crisis and convince her to return to her training with Ahsoka, and that despite her limitations and lack of connection to the Force, she could still be a credible warrior trained in the Jedi arts. Alrighty then. Ahsoka and Hera discover that Elsbeth's supposedly decommissioned factories are packed with Imperial loyalists operating once again. Why won't you die? And constructing hyperdrives for a larger model of transport that will allow Elsbeth and Code to travel out beyond their galaxy to find Thrawn. And after Chopper places a tracker on the hyperdrive core as it gets away, Ahsoka engages the random Inquisitor following Skull and Hati named Maroc, and easily defeats him, leaving him to run with Hati back to Elsbeth. And although this isn't the closing shot, we see Sabine return time with her armour, and as she suits up she gets the Kanan special on her hair, and informs Ahsoka that she's ready for this mission, donning Ezra's lightsaber and is ready to become her apprentice once more, bringing us back to the closing shot of Rebels where we see the pair jettison off to find Ezra. It all makes sense now. Now, as we've seen over recent years, Disney has repeatedly tried to push the franchise into new and, depending on your point of view, fascinating directions with the likes of Mando, Andor and Fett, all presenting different genres rarely explored in isolation. From a space western to a gritty political drama to a criminal underworld romp, respectively. And they've been met with mixed reactions to say the least, with everyone finding interest in something somewhere or not. But Ahsoka has managed to surprise me, proving to be in a very unique position, as just from this one episode, I feel it's managed to incorporate a lot of these elements whilst feeling the most Star Wars that a show has felt in some time. No, no. He's got a point. Where it talks about the mysticism of the Force with Elsbeth's connection to Thrawn through time and space, and it shows the rapid decay of the New Republic right under their noses, continuing from Mando Season 3. Wow. Whilst being driven by years of previous character and plot work, where it doesn't need to waste time explaining who everyone is, just simply explain their current states and then move on. And from this as well, you start to get a grander scale of this universe as we begin wondering what else is out there, beyond the parameters of this galaxy alone that has explored our beloved stories and characters with within the Skywalker saga and beyond. So now the question comes of what else is out there and what could Thrawn bring back with him in knowledge or otherwise that might push this universe of storytelling into genuinely exciting territories, or at least unlock the door of, once Elspeth and Co locate him, and as we know from trailers this will be the case, with all blue balls coming home, and possibly teeming with knowledge about the unexplored regions of the universe. These are dark times, there is no denying. 
an aspect of which adds a sense of anxiety and excitement to this for me again, as I feel there's much to explore in the nature of the Force here, as we seem to have new discoveries regarding it every time a new Jedi or Sith is presented in one of these shows, but I think we're at a point where some exploring is needed to broaden our horizons, especially if the old and High Republic and before are set to be explored in future shows and movies. <laughs> This show alone could act as a trendsetter, and who better to lead that charge, in my opinion, than dear old Dave. That's a bold statement. Who seems ready to pull the trigger on reintroducing Legends material and characters where possible, as we had a possible hint of here with the Rakatans, who in Legends were believed to have invented hyperspace technology which could have been inspired by or due to the Pargill, which transported Ezra and Thrawn out of there at the end of Rebels, and are likely one of the few species in the galaxy that can travel without necessary preparations. Holy shit! And there were signs of the Pergil around the projections in the star maps when it's centred on Peridia, so that would indicate either the star map is aware of current events, or the Pergil are native to, or can frequent this other galaxy. This is my theory at least, but I am honestly pumped to see how this unfolds as one of the biggest eye catchers in recent memory. Then to rein it in somewhat, Morgan surprised me last episode as someone I didn't delve into much, but the revelation to me at least that she is in fact a Night Sister did come as a shock. Due to the rest of her clan, assuming her age is in line with the other women we saw in Clone Wars, are for all intents and purposes dead, aside from Meryn in Fallen Order, thanks to General Grievous both striking down the clan and the late Mother Towson during the Clone War. I mentioned last time that her presence at Thrawn's side could prove invaluable, and if manipulated correctly, could offer a huge assist in his return and rise to prominence once more. And it falls in line with his fascination in the Force that he explains in Rebels eludes him but he truly wishes to understand, so here's one avenue that could teach him just from a less refined, raw and untamed form. Elspeth didn't feel like anyone special when she debuted in Mando, but to throw this lineage into her character adds a level of depth that, as I mentioned, could be formidable, but makes this a battle of the ages as well as a cute reference for long-time Clone Wars fans. As for our girl here, she certainly isn't fucking around anymore, taking out Imperial officers like it's a sport, giving Morocco a run for his money in impressive style, and showing just how unprepared the Inquisitors were under Vader's reign, and displaying an experienced use of the Force that, to my knowledge, only Quinlan Voss has presented before in canon, though don't quote me on that. And she finally manages to relinquish her concerns and embrace Sabine once again as her apprentice, once the young lass was willing though, and all it took was the combined interest of preventing disaster and the potential of locating a friend. Sabine didn't have a huge amount to do in this besides hacking a droid head and getting a good lecture from Huang, but for the time we did spend with her, she has proven to be different but the same. I think the presence of Sabine is there, and you can only do so much to replicate animation, but the way she's being portrayed is possibly what's losing me. I'm not trying to compare this version of the character as such to the one we know, but I think it's going to take some time for me to warm up to this portrayal of her. I can see this isn't the same Sabine that we ended with in Rebels, as she's a little older now and was an apprentice to Ahsoka, who gave up on her for reasons we've yet to explore, so that would have certainly impacted her growth. But she had to mature quicker than most young women of her age, as her homeworld was at war with itself and the Empire throughout her life. Huang was the one to steal this again as David Tennant's personality and charisma just shone through this relic of bolts, and his moment with Sabine was extremely profound as he possesses so much awareness for things greater than himself as something as well that is supposed to be comprised of programming and AI. His pep talk with her made this entire episode for me as he counsels her for a moment, reminding her that despite her ineptitude with the Force, which informs us at least that she is not Force-sensitive, thank God, she has so much potential as a warrior with Jedi training, so don't stop now. I've seen people say that this just destroys the idea of the Jedi, and being trained as one requires you to have the Force, but here's the thing. Ahsoka may have been a Jedi and practices their methods, but she doesn't have to adhere to the standard practices of the Jedi anymore, meaning if she wants to take Sabine under her wing and teach her lightsaber formations and such, I'd say let it happen. Kanan was already doing that in Rebels and no one really bitched about it then, so what's the difference now? You know why? Because f you, that's why. And as for Hera and Chop, it was just awesome to see the pair together again, throwing shade at each other and bickering like always. While Skull was offered some fascinating complexity here, where at the end he confesses he doesn't seek nor wish for Ahsoka or any more Jedi to die, informing us at least that he doesn't side with the Sith ideals of Jedi extermination. Though we do see him and Ahsoka clash in the trailers, so no doubt the pair will come to blows over something soon, and it will seemingly be something essential, otherwise he doesn't strike me as someone willing to kill. I mean, 
mean look at his actions in the opening of the season and how he tried to navigate his way on board without harm. Strong enough to have it all. Too weak to take it! And generally, this episode does an excellent job of moving Finns forward without dragging its heels like the last one did in places, with moments like Ahsoka being shown to steadily decipher the triangulation of the dials to release the star map. And are you bored yet? <laughs> The pacing was breezy, the plot was predictable but amusing, and the musical motifs were very kinder. The backdrops and CG never felt like a distraction for me, and the action was some of the best I've seen in live action Star Wars for some time. And we can finally look to moving forward with the series into newer territory, having been reunited with the epilogue of Star Wars Rebels that shows Ahsoka and Sabine beginning their journey. And overall, I think we're off to a promising start with Ahsoka, now that we've had the busy work all done and dusted, but to answer the question that's been floating around recently, of could Ahsoka be enough to save Star Wars, regrettably my feeling is no. Excuse me, uh, the, uh, the fuck did you just say? As this series isn't a convergence for various corners of the Star Wars fandom to get behind, it's intended for those that have the full context behind these characters, and if you don't, you're going to struggle. Over time, this show could become a legacy win, but right now the tensions are high with audiences, the trust is gone, and Kathleen and Bob have done no favours for this franchise. However, as a long-time Ahsoka, Clone Wars and Rebels fan, I'm in for the ride. Anyway, that's all I've got for this week. If you like this one, hit the thumbs up and subscribe if you're new for the rest of my coverage on Ahsoka and future shows like Walking Dead Daryl Dixon. And until next time everyone, take care and may the Force be with you.